strange view here. Okay, hi, hi everyone. Um, hi. Uh, hi everyone and welcome to uh, the workshop. Um, I'm just gonna give a very short introduction and then uh, let Umesh take over. Um, so I'm Shafi Goldwasser, I'm the director of the Simons Institute. Um, as you, you know, uh, we are having a wonderful semester, <laughs> or we were having a wonderful semester, um, having all of you come to, to Berkeley, some uh, on a permanent basis in the sense of a few months and some uh, shorter. Uh, and at this point, we're doing everything remotely. I wanted to um, uh, just say a few uh, guidelines. We have uh, a, um, panelists who are, are able to speak at any time. We have the rest of the participants who can post questions and answers. And then one of the panelists will uh, uh, let the speaker know of the questions and answers. I think even the speaker himself has access to it. But I assume that the program organizers themselves will give you more detailed instructions of how uh, how they want to run it, and specifically the workshop organizers. Um, I want to thank everybody for making the effort to join remotely. I want to thank the organizers, especially of this workshop, who have completely switched the program around to make sure that people all around the world can join with respect to their time zones. I know that's not trivial to do the work twice. We've done the work before the program, during the program, and now again for this uh, remote participation. And I hope everyone is well. And for my sake, I guess um, when you speak, it would be great if uh, you say your names and where you're talking from, at least in the beginning. So um, that's all I'm going to say. You know, usually we we talk about what we can and yes, you can't hear me the whole time. Hello. Well, we could have we heard you. Oh, I thought somebody said something. I just wanted to say that we usually have all kinds of instructions about what you can cannot bring to the auditorium and that sort of thing. Obviously, you can do whatever you want, but hopefully <laughs> do it quietly. So um, welcome, everyone. And I think Umesh is going to take over from here, say a few words. Go, go ahead, Umesh. Sorry, I'm muted. OK, hi, hi Shafi, thanks. So um, thanks, everybody, for for coming to this uh, workshop, this virtual workshop. Uh, it's, um, I guess, uh, a new regime here at uh, Simons. Um, so let me just say a few words about, um, about this, uh, the intent of this workshop. Um, so as you probably know, uh, quantum protocols have become a pretty central part of the entire enterprise, uh, all the way from, from uh, physically testing quantum systems to very theoretical questions about what the power of uh, multiple provers is, um, and so in fact, this this workshop, uh, as you can as you can imagine, it's evolved a lot over time as this um, as this current crisis has has developed, and um, and so um, the um, as as Shafi said, the organizers had a lot to do in in terms of uh, keeping up with uh, with. Uh, with what was happening and and uh, and restructuring their program. So the way the program is now, um, day one and day four, um, uh, deal with uh, with the physical aspects of uh, you know benchmarking and tomography. So how do you characterize quantum systems using physical assumptions? Uh, uh, there, there's a you know so so this this entire workshop is is as as you can imagine. Uh, um, uh, structured around how do you interrogate qu uh, quantum systems? Uh, so, um, and how do you how do you get uh, to understand various properties of the system or or get information out of it? And um, and so there there's there are, you know, in addition to this physical model, there's also um, a cryptographic uh, way that you can do this interrogation. And that was actually uh, much of that actually took place in last week's workshop. Uh, where, which was with the Lattice program. And then there's uh, day, day two and three of this uh, program has to do with multiple provers, uh, which are not interacting and how a classical uh, verifier can, can interact with, uh, with these multiple untrusted provers. And of course, the, the star of that, uh, you know, of that entire um, uh, subject is the, the recent MIT star equal to uh, RE, uh, 
uh, result, uh, which is, um, you know, absolutely stunning. And so the hope is, um, you know, so what you'll hear about is is the basics of that result. So so by the by the end of those day two and three, hopefully you'll understand the 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 bones of that result, the consequences, and uh, you know the motivation, um, as well as some variants of the model. Okay, now there was one thing that um, that was casualty to this uh, this crisis, which is uh, uh, the the organizers had actually set up these talks by experimentalists to talk about actual experiments about about uh, some of these topics, and unfortunately, uh, um, that part had to be cancelled. Um, I should say a couple of words about um, about the, how how to approach this meeting. I hope that. Uh, that uh, that the audience will take uh, take part in the meeting. Uh, you know that we'll make it as interactive as possible. So please ask lots of questions. And um, you know there's uh, there's also some ways in which this this Zoom setting, this uh, online setting, you know, uh, well we'll try to make it as you know as good as possible as uh, as an interactive in person seminar but there are some ways in which it may, may it might even be be better so for example this chat on the side uh, one way you can think about it is well you know if you're in in the uh, attending a talk with your favorite person beside you uh, you can sort of have a little whispered conversation to clarify things um, that you're not understanding. Well, you can use the chat that way. You can ask questions. And then actually, if you're watching the chat and if you see a question that you know how to answer, actually answer it. And that can that can take the place of this uh, this sort of informal interaction on the side. And then the, the panelists will pick up on questions which are which which might be of more general interest or which haven't been answered and actually either unmute you or ask the speaker directly uh, about those questions. So, okay, well, with, with that introduction, I shouldn't take up much more of your time except to say, uh, well, thank you to all the speakers who, who've uh, agreed to uh, to speak during these next few days. And, uh, and of course, thanks to all the organizers. I should turn the mic over to Dorit, who is chairing the first session. Okay, managed to unmute myself. Uh, thanks, Umesh. Um, so it's really nice to see everyone, at least uh, by name, on the side. Um, and um, uh, I should say there's sort of there is the chat window, but there's also the the question and answers window, uh, which I'm I'm not sure if uh, if that was used before uh, in the conference before, but that could be also used if you want uh, to sort of single out a question uh, that I will see and. Uh, if I manage to actually see it, I will forward it uh, uh, and say it aloud. Um, I can also unmute um, you guys uh, at various points uh, if anybody wants. Um, so um, maybe I think we have one more minute. So maybe I'll say uh, um, one thing about, uh, about how this conference uh, worked and following what Umesh uh, was starting to say. Um, well, uh, uh, somehow this conference is about uh, the connection between, um, well, we have a system which is exponentially hard to characterize and verify. And over the past, uh, I don't know, decade or so, there's been a lot of work in from various directions asking this question. Um, some of them uh, uh, is more from the physics side, um, um, where you don't have the need to assume completely malicious um, systems or environments, but uh, there are lots of assumptions that you can make. And, um, and in the workshop, we have a lot of talks from that side about uh, benchmarking and about uh, uh, the talk that we're just going to, that we're just about to hear by Itai of other ways to do that. And then on the other extreme, there is sort of the malicious or the cryptographic setting where the system is completely um, against us, uh, the physical system, and we want to understand what happens there in the completely malicious case. And we'll hear a lot about this. And what when we organized uh, the schedule for the workshop and we set up the, the different talks, we thought of actually putting together uh, the two different sides of cryptography and um, characterization verification from the more physics side. Um, so the most malicious up to uh, the physical setting and see whether the different approaches and techniques can 
can uh, can be of interest to the different sides. So um, with that in mind, let's uh, start with Itai Arad from uh, the Technion, who is, uh, who's going to tell us about the more physics approach. Itai. So now you're, you're on your I, 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 I. Can you talk, Itai? Uh, I can talk. Can you hear me? Yes, good. Yes. OK. So. And I hope you can see the screen. It's OK? Yes, it's OK. OK. So, uh, so first, I want to thank the, the organizer for organizing these, um, this conference um, in spite of all um, the coronavirus and everything. Um, and um, <clears throat> uh, so thank you, thank you very much. And um, it's a great honor to be the, the first speaker. So I hope uh, everything works fine. Okay, so um, so uh, as Dorit was saying, I'm going to talk about um, verification and characterization of, um, of quantum systems, many body quantum systems. And um, I'm going to do it um, a little bit from the physics side, it will not be so much of a, in, from the crypto side. And um, this, is work, this is a work uh, which is based on, um, on two papers uh, with, with collaborators with uh, Eyal Berry and Nathaniel Lindner from Technion and uh, Gochu and Dario Poletti, Gochu from QI Lab in China and uh, Dario Poletti from uh, SCTD in Singapore. Um, and the talk is based on, on these uh, two papers. Okay, so, um, so what, what exactly um, the problem I'm trying to uh, describe and solve in here, uh, to attack in here is uh, the problem of characterize characterization and verification uh, in the NISC area. NISC of nearly of noisy uh, intermediate um, quantum systems. Um, <clears throat> so we are giving a, a mid-size noisy quantum device, the one, for example, that Google used to show uh, some sort of uh, supremacy. Um, so this is a very, this, this device is, is, is extremely noisy um, on, on one side, on the other side. Um, it is also uh, very large so that we cannot no longer simulate it classically. And, uh, and the question is that, how do we characterize uh, this type of system? We need to characterize it if you want to optimize the gates, the dynamic, uh, and also we need, we need to characterize it, um, uh, we need to verify it if we, if we want to be, to be sure that the device is, is, is doing what it is supposed to do. If it is supposed to find a ground state of a certain Hamiltonian, it is supposed to do simulate the time dynamics of a Hamiltonian or, or do some sort of a simple quantum circuit, we want to be able to, to verify that it is indeed um, doing its task. So, so this is the, the general problem that I am trying to, uh, to study here. Um, okay, and, um, and the approach that I want to present here is, uh, is a relatively new approach and it is based, um, in, in, in a sense, it is based on the non-commutativity of the, of the quantum generators. So in, in some sense, this is a purely quantum, a purely quantum approach. Uh, and and, and as, as we shall see, it will be kind of, of useless or worthless in, in, in the classical setting. Uh, and these are the, the details of the, of the two papers. Um, it is based on the first paper was applying this method for closed system for Hamiltonians. And, and the second system was uh, extended it to open system or specifically to Lindbladian systems. Okay, so, um, so let's talk about a little bit about verification. Um, so as, as Dorit was saying um, before, uh, before um, when we talk about verification, we can, we can roughly um, uh, divide it into into two uh, two part two, two two different types of verif verifications. There is uh, one very big uh, body of work uh, of verification from the uh, cryptographic uh, stand, uh, standpoint, um, and um, these these work they uh, they have uh, uh, certain assumptions, and and these assumptions usually usually in these assumption we are. Uh, dealing with a malicious uh, party, we're trying to encrypt uh, um, uh, in order to uh, uh, to deal with these parties. Um, and many times, uh, many very often, uh, we are not 
too concerned about about noise simply maybe simply because it is already very complicated to um, to ensure uh, security um, without noise and and then um, uh, in these systems uh, well we we have certain certain assumptions that we take uh, for example we can assume that the verifier has a has a small red quantum register on which it can work and um, and you know, he can handle it perfectly. It's a clean uh, quantum register and it is completely private. Or we can have uh, the assumption that there are actually two quantum provers, uh, but they are, we, are no, we know that they are very distant apart. So we can use some sort of a CHSH game or, or we can use some sort of uh, computational assumptions like uh, learning with errors, like um, uh, in order to, to guarantee that uh, we are not fooled by the by the prover. So, but um, <clears throat> most of these assumptions are not very relevant when we, uh, when if we are trying to to verify um, a NISC a NISC device, a, a noisy intermediate scale device. Um, <clears throat> and in these uh, circumstances, um, well, uh, the problem is that we have a very noisy system, but on one side, but on the other side, we we don't really have a malicious, uh, a malicious uh, party, okay? I mean, nature might be very noisy, but it is not malicious. Um, so uh, so we, usually we might take different assumptions, for example, that uh, um, noise is not uh, adversarially correlated or that only certain types of measurements or gates are allowed or certain geometries, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, the, um, and the setup that I'm going to talk about is, is exactly this setup of of, uh, of the of the of the NISC uh, era. Okay, so uh, when we're talking when we when we want to characterize a, a noisy devices, there are several approaches. Um, by far, I think the uh, on the top of the hill we have randomized benchmarking, which is um, a method that has been around for, I guess, something like 15 years. It is extremely robust. It is very scalable. One of the best best uh, things about it is that, that it is insensitive to uh, to spam error, to state preparation and measurement error. Um, <clears throat> and um, and in, in, in some instances, it is also very scalable. On the other hand, it, it, it gives us a very uh, relatively uh, limited information about um, about the noise in the system and, 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 and what is going on, what is actually going on there. Uh, it gives us some sort of an, of an average fidelity or, or in, in the end, it, it is relatively a, a low number of parameters that we can extract out of this, uh, out of this method. On the other extreme, there are some sort of uh, tomography-like uh, protocols, for example, uh, gate set tomography, which gives us a very detailed information about the noise in the system and what exactly, what kind of gates actually we are applying. But it is, um, it is it is not really very scalable. And um, so the question that I'm trying to answer here is whether there is somewhere something in the middle that we that we can do something that will give us more information probably than um, than randomized benchmarking, and yet will be uh, will be uh, a bit more uh, scalable, for example, than uh, gate set tomography. Uh, maybe if we we might even. Uh, maybe with the sacrifice of some assumptions. Um, and also, uh, most imp also importantly, um, even if we, in both of these uh, uh, setup, in, in randomized benchmarking and in gate set tomography, we are kind of, uh, we are kind of doing characterization of, of single gates or, or single measurement operation. But what we would like in the next step is to able to put everything together into and see if it actually works when it tries to simulate a particular Hamiltonian or try to execute a, a particular uh, a circuit. So in some sense, this is only, these things only apply for the first step and but we want to see how they, how they work together, how they uh, uh, coordinate uh, together. So this is another thing that uh, I, I will try to, uh, to address here. Okay, so, um, so, as I was saying, what I'm going to talk about is how to use uh, the non-commutativity of the quantum operators to characterize and verify uh, many-body uh, quantum systems. Okay, and um, in some sense, the entire approach can be can be stated in two words: Ernst uh, theorem. And 
The theorem is, 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 is this theorem here, which you can, which you can see. Let's assume, uh, I mean, here, sorry, here I'm talking about, uh, uh, let, let's assume we have a closed system governed by a uh, Hamiltonian H. Um, so we know that the, the time evolution of the system, if it is a closed system, is given by, by this equation. The, the, the time derivative of rho, the, the state of the system, is given by minus i times the commutator of H uh, with rho. Um, <clears throat> if we now uh, multiply it by some observable a and take the trace, then we can uh, we immediately uh, get the uh, Enthuist uh, theorem that states how the expectation value of an observable how it uh, develops in time. Um, so let us now uh, consider a steady state, a state in which the the system uh, the system does not evolve, so the time derivative of rho is zero. And therefore, also the, the time derivative of every expectation value of every observable will also vanish. In this case, what we will get is, is this um, equation here that the average of the commutator of H with any observable A will be equal to zero. This is what I want to use. I want to take this equation and, 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 and see all the type of constraints that it implies and use it in order to characterize and verify H. And the dynamic that it, it generates. So, um, so how can we use it, for example, to learn a local Hamiltonian? So, so let's assume we have a system that sits on a lattice like this system here. So for example, let's assume it's a 2D lattice with nearest neighbor's interaction. And let us assume that we are giving some sort of a steady state of the system. And, but we don't know the Hamiltonian. We don't know the underlying Hamiltonian. So how can, we, how, how can we recover it from the other underlying state? So the idea is to uh, expand, first of all, H in terms of a basis of, uh, in terms of some basis of local interactions, because we assume it is, um, it is a, a local system with local interactions. So this basis must be uh, of polynomial size. For example, if it is a two local Hamiltonian, this basis should be of the order of uh, N squared, where N is the number of, uh, spins in the system. And moreover, if it is uh, nearest neighbor's interaction, it's, it should be of even of the order of n. And um, so we can pick up this kind of basis. For example, it can be some products of, of Pauli basis. And, um, and then plug it in, plugging it into the equation that we saw before, what we get is we get these, um, these, this set of equations for the, uh, for the, for the coefficient Cs of the different uh, basis elements in which we expanded H. And um, <clears throat> the idea of, of, of the method that I, I want to present is simply to take few of these, uh, of these operators A, uh, let's, let's, uh, let's number them by one to, uh, to capital N. And for each one of these operators, we will get a set of, uh, we, get, we will get a, a constraint, an equation for the coefficient CS and uh, Putting all these constraints together, we obtain this type of uh, linear, uh, linear, linear homogeneous equation where KJS, now the, the matrix of the equation, is given, its entries are given by the commutator of the basis element PS with the uh, observable AJ. So, um, <clears throat> so, <clears throat> Uh, okay, so this is the, base, the basic equation, and the idea is that we can now uh, measure these, uh, these expectation value. By measuring this expectation value, we can measure the, the matrix K, uh, KJS, and, by, uh, and then by looking for, the, for, its, uh, for its kernel, we can find these, uh, these coefficients CS, and from, from using these coefficients, we can simply recover H. So um, before okay. going on, I want to... I want to uh, to stress that this method relies on, on the non-commutativity of the underlying uh, quantum, quantum uh, dynamics. And, and um, uh, why is that so? Yes? Uh, yeah, sorry. Um, so what, can, can you go back to the slide? So yes. uh, this expectation value is with respect to what state again? Um, to some might... steady state that I'm given. I'm given some, uh, some steady state rho, uh, which, is, which I assume is a steady state of the Hamiltonian. And therefore, I know that this, this equation is uh, holds. So the expectation value of H with any 
of the commutator of H with any observable A should should vanish. So, so is a steady state like an eigenvector? Like an eigen it could be an eigenvector, but it doesn't have to be an eigenvector. It can be any convex combination of eigenvectors. It can be, for example, a, a Gibbs state. Okay, gotcha. Thanks. But just for Dominic, do you want to ask? Yeah, the we assume that the PS they are known, and we only yes. try to yes. figure out the CS. Okay. Yes, exactly. The PS are known. I mean, I mean, what I'm doing here, I'm using prior knowledge. I'm using. I mean, I, I, you know, I assume that the Hamiltonian is, for example, is two local and nearest neighbors. So that will that will dictate the type of PS that I'm using. So I will use, you know, only product of Pauli's of nearest neighbor qubits, for example. Okay. Um, so, so as I, as I was saying, um, what what hide what what hide behind this method is is the non commutativity of the of, of the quantum operators. And and to see why this is true, let us see. Let us try to convince ourselves that it cannot work in the commuting case. So let's assume we have now um, a local Hamiltonian that it is made of these small h's. So it's the sum of these h i. And let's assume it's a commuting local Hamiltonian, so these H's commute with each other. And um, if we have a if we have a, a, a um, an eigenstate of the system which commute with all these H's, or we have a, another steady a convex combination of these eigenbases, um, then in some then that would mean that 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 rho is compatible with every H with this, which is a linear which is a linear combination of all these uh, H's. In other words, if Rho commutes with every small h i, it will also commute with every linear combination of these small h i, and so it will commute with, with every, with every uh, Hamiltonian that is, uh, that is given by such a, a linear combination. And, and as a result, what it means, it means that, that actually this, um, this linear equation that we will obtain, the K matrix that we will measure from the system, well, it will have a huge degenerate space and the and the uh, the dimension of the space will be uh, as uh, at least of the size of the uh, of the different uh, of, the, of the number of the of, of the of the hi's there Ita, so, can you uh, show again please the matrix k yeah so so this is the matrix k okay okay so if all HIs, meaning all PSs, commute with each other, then how do we see that that all CSs are? No, no. you will not, you will not you will not see uh, uh, the HIs are not the PS. The PS is a known basis. Okay, mm -hmm. the PS is a known basis, and 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 the HI might be unknown. It, it for example, it, it might be some local Hamiltonian that commutes with itself. I don't know the Tori code, for example, or, or whatever. You, you don't know it a priori. Okay, this is what we want to learn. But I'm saying that what I'm saying is that the the the, the only thing on which the uh, uh, on which the method uh, the method relies it relies on the assumption that h commutes that h uh, commutes with uh, with rho in some sense. Okay, um, this is this is everything the the, the, the method uh, relies on. So the uh, the commutator of h with rho is is the is the is, is derivative is the derivative of rho, and so if if rho is a steady state, it means that this commutator is zero. So everything relies on the fact that, that H uh, commutes with rho. But if H is made of, 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 of local operators that all commute with themselves, then you, can, you have that for a given rho, you can come up with an infinite number of H's that will commute with it. And, and therefore, that what it implies, it implies that, this, that necessarily this method will yell it Will be should be able to yield each each in one of these H's. So it means that this equation K C equal to zero ha must have a lot of solutions. So um, Itai, um, yes, um, uh, yeah. So can I ask? Uh, um, so let's say that um, you you are trying to characterize a quantum system, but let's say you don't know. You know, maybe maybe actually it was a it was a classical system. And so now you write write down these constraints, and they're noisy. So, uh, w would you just end up getting some kind of unstable solution? So, you know, in in practice, you probably won't because of noise. It wouldn't be degenerate anymore. But uh, but now, would you just get an arbitrary solution, or is 
Well, what I, uh, okay, we, we will get to it, but uh, my guess is that what, what you will, um, what you will, what you will see, you will see, uh, um, because, because it will be noisy, so uh, there will be probably uh, a unique, uh, uh, there will be only one guy that minimizes uh, in some sense, okay? I mean, you will, you, you will never get a pure KC equal to zero solution just because of the noise but you will get an, a, a, a polynomially many uh, solutions which are all very, very close to zero. Okay, you will not have, uh, you will not have like a, a unique solution and then a gap above it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, okay, so, so because this method will not work for commuting for commuting Hamiltonians, then it will be uh, it will be useless uh, for for classical systems. Um, so now let me um, uh, let, let me uh, just uh, sorry uh, describe the the algorithm uh, to summarize what uh, the method. What we what we do is we, we start with uh, we, we we start with H so that we expand it in, in terms of uh, unknown coefficients of some basis of I don't know for example if it is uh, uh, local interact you know, local two body interaction so it will be some sort of Pauli's for example um, then we will then we will uh, come up with um, n uh, n n uh, observables and we will demand this this n will be uh, greater than, than m, the number of uh, basis elements. And we will use uh, small n measurements to estimate the entry matrix of this, of, of this k. So it will be a tilde kjs. And it will be an approximation for the real kjs, which is the expectation value of this commutator. And then, uh, because it will be only be an approximation to the real case, we, we don't expect it to have, uh, to have an exact zero uh, vector. So instead of, of finding the zero vector, we will, fi we will find uh, the minimal, uh, um, the minimal uh, right eigenvector of it, if you wish, or the, we will find the vector that minimizes the norm of, uh, of k times, uh, times c. Or in other words, this will be just the, the ground state of this uh, positive, uh, semi-positive definite matrix, uh, which we get by taking uh, uh, K dagger times K. Okay, so um, we can do, now do uh, a little bit of, of analysis of how this method works. Uh, well, just as Umesh said, uh, the K that we get in the algorithm is not the real K. It is, uh, it is a, an approximation for the K and we, we, we we have we have some we have some uh, we have some noise due to the uh, statistical to the fact that we are only using sampling from a finite number of uh, measurements. Um, so how, how how do we know uh, how far is uh, the C the solution that we get from the actual solution and the and the idea is that uh, sorry Tai right now the reason for the approximation is just the fact that. There is statistical noise, meaning that you have yes. estimations of some random. That's variable. right. There's no That's noise right. in the system. Sorry. There's no noise. There's no. You didn't introduce noise in the measurements or anything like that. It's yeah, I assume noise. you're you're perfectly right. I assume here that my measurements are perfect. That's right. Uh, I I I'm, I mean these the algorithm only uses measurement in some sense. So so. It, it assumed that I'm that I'm only using measurements that the measurements are perfect and and moreover in in, in that sense it also assumes that um, the many different copies that I'm using in order to generate the statistics are all identical to each other. That's another assumption that goes into it. Um, okay, so so the key to understand how 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 uh, how C is different from the uh, from C tilde, so how the the measure C is, is is different from the actual C is, is to look at the at the at the, uh, at the spectral gap of, of this matrix K, and um, so it will not be very surprising to 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 see that if K has a spectral gap, so if it, the if the actual K, the real K, has has only one zero vector and above it all the all the all the singular uh on the singular vectors uh singular values that come above it uh, are separated by a gap then this uh then then our algorithm will be stable in the sense that if we uh, 
if k tilde is only approximately k, then still uh, c, uh, c tilde will be uh, close to c, and, and we can, uh, we can it's, it's not very difficult to prove it uh, rigorously. So there is, we have this theorem here that says that if k is the exact n by m constraint matrix, and if uh, k tilde is the uh, empirical uh, approximation to it, um, then with high pro and, and if we're using NS measurement, then with, with high probability delta, this distance between the empirical uh, solution and the exact solution will be uh, upper bounded by, by this expression here. And as you can see, the key, the key element that goes in here is, is the spectral gap, is this, is this lambda one here. So uh, in other words, in order, to, in order to get some reliable results, um, we will need something of the order of n divided by uh, the spectral gap squared uh, measurement. And um, the theorem is, is, is quite standard. I mean, to prove it, we use Weyl's inequalities for singular values plus the uh, matrix uh, Chernoff bound. And um, yeah, uh, this is it. Uh, so, um, okay. So what, what, it, what it also tells us is that, um, so what we also learned from it is that first, well, the spectral gap is, is the most important thing here. And, but, and, we, and while it is unfortunate that, we, that given a certain model, it's, a, it's not easy to, to know a priori what kind of spectral gap this constraint matrix K will have, this is something that we can verify uh, post priori. I mean, we can, we can measure, we can calculate k tilde and we can see if it has a gap. If it has a gap, then we know we're safe and we know that our results are okay. So this is, this is I think, uh, an important point. Okay, and uh, so let me give uh, several remarks of it, um, about it. If, uh, if the steady state that we are using is, um, is a pure state, so in other words, um, if it is, uh, if it is an eigenstate of H, and we are using all possible AJ constraints, so not only these local AJ, but all type of, uh, of observables, then the condition that K uh, is annihilated by C will just become this condition that uh, the variance of, 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 uh, of the energy on, on Psi is, is, is vanishing. And this is exactly the condition of, of Kian and Renard from their paper in 2017 and in the method that they, um, they pioneered for, um, for learning a local Hamiltonian from a single eigenstate. Mm -hmm. So in some sense, our method um, generalizes their, their, uh, their results by, uh, by allowing, allowing us also to work not only with, um, with the steady states that are eigenstate of Hamiltonian, but with any convex combination, with any with, of, of, of eigenstate, or in other words, with any, with any row that is uh, commuting with the Hamiltonian. Um, another advantage of our method is that uh, because these AI, these constraints AI can be, can be local, then we, th this method is extremely local in the sense that if we only want to recover a local patch of the system, if you only want to learn a local patch of the system, then all we have to do is, is, is use Local a is use local a's that sit on this on this patch, and as a result, all the constraint that we'll get will only will only involve the um, the part of h that is that is uh, that acts on this on this patch. So uh, <clears throat> so okay. So this this only this also means that uh, if there are if there are some Bad, you know, if, if there are some other places in the system that don't work very well, it probably might not influence uh, our, uh, you know, the result in, in, in other patches. Um, uh, another point is that we can also use uh, several uh, steady states together uh, in order to, uh, to get stronger constraints and, and therefore uh, implicitly increase the gap in, in, in K. So using several, uh, for example, using Gibbs state at several temperatures, for example, or using different eigenstates. I, I have a question to yes. make sure that I got it right. So in the classical case that you talked earlier about, we would just have the case that the 
lambda one is zero, and that's why it doesn't work because you would need infinitely many measurements according to your formula, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. And we have and another question. Oh, hi, this is Lee Barford from Keysight Technologies. Um, no measurement is perfect, so but to decide whether the, a measurement error is so small that it can be ignored, the measurement needs to be thoroughly understood. What measurement uh, then are you proposing to estimate the K tilde matrix and what's, its, what, what's their measurement error characteristics? Yeah, so uh, that, that's a very good point. And uh, as I was saying, different, different uh, approaches take different assumptions. And currently, in this assumption that I'm using, I'm assuming boldly and unjustifiably uh, perfect measurements. And, um, and one of the open questions that I would like to raise in the end is how to incorporate this method and how to generalize it to handle also um, biases in the measurements and errors in the measurements. But currently, everything that I'm talking about, I'm assuming perfect measurements. Ita, can I, can I ask, a, uh, so do you have an intuitive, even an intuitive understanding of lambda one? So what is it, is there, is there any, any way to understand what it depends upon and when it would be large? Um, well, it certainly depends upon how uh, about the non commuteness of the yeah. of, of, of the system and in, in some sense, how the um, how you need a lot of a lot of these local terms in the Hamiltonian in order to uh, annihilate the ground state or commute with the ground state. So, for example, another case where the gap closes down is when you have a frustration free Hamiltonian. So it doesn't have to be commuting, but if, if, even if it is only commuting on a single eigenstate and you're trying to recover it from that eigenstate, then you will also run into problems simply because, you know, there are many different Hamiltonians that are compatible. I mean, if there is one frustration-free Hamiltonian on that eigenstate, then there are many different other frustration-free, I mean, just multiply them by some positive number. So, so in some sense, it, it tells you how, a little bit about the angle of, of, of between, you know, between the action of the different of the different local terms of, of the Hamiltonian um, on 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 this on this uh, steady state, that's that's my uh, my intuition. Great, thank you. Okay. Um, okay. So. Um, let me let me give you some uh, um, some numerical results that we have. These are very uh, simple numerical results. Um, so, for example, um, if we are trying in the, in the first the first example is is like the result run on ensemble of random Hamiltonians, and um, we um, we artificially added some some measurement noise to them. So it is here. It is ten to the minus four. It's, not very realistic, but um, uh, this is what we've done here. And um, what we sh what we, what uh, what we see in this graph is uh, the, the y-axis tells you the this delta, the 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 difference between the the exact um, the exact Hamiltonian and the uh, the reconstructed Hamiltonian, and n tells you the number of local constraints uh, that we are using. And as you can see, when we increase n, we uh, we gradually improve the quality of, of reconstruction until we kind of, of, uh, of saturate. And there is a, a big change here around 100, which, which is, you know, the minute we, our, the number of the constraints we use suppresses the number of, uh, of, of basis elements in, in, uh, in, um, in H, then we start seeing non-trivial uh, results. Um, Another example is, is when we can do much better, actually, is when we have some sort of prior knowledge on the Hamiltonian. So, so in the first example, we knew nothing about the Hamiltonian except that they are uh, nearest neighbors and sitting on a line, but and too local. But we didn't know anything about the, the form of the actual operators. Here in the second example, we, we allow ourselves to we know much, much more than that. We, we, we assume that the Hamiltonian is of that form with only two unknown parameters, capital J and H. And, um, and then accordingly, what you can see is that um, 
with a very uh, high noise level of, uh, of 0 0.1, uh, we can still recover. Uh, um, we can still recover the Hamiltonian to a very good, uh, to a very good accuracy. Okay, so, and and this is this is like one of things. I think one of the strengths of this of this method is that you can you can insert some sort of prior knowledge, and you can also always self consistently check yourself to see to see if this if this solution that you got if this C actually minimizes the K. If you know that it minimizes, then it gives you okay. So I'm I'm I, I'm on the on the right, uh, on the right uh, spot, on the right region. Um, <clears throat> and this is uh, another example where we no longer um, learn the Hamiltonian from uh, from pure state or from the ground state. We actually uh, learn it from uh, from a Gibbs state. Um, so, um, and um, not surprisingly, the quality of the reconstruction depends highly on the on the temperature. The, as the temperature rises. Uh, the Gibbs state will become, will approach the completely mixed state, and clearly this state is compatible with many different Hamiltonians, so that, that implies that the quality must degrade, or in other words, the gap in K must, uh, must, must shrink, and uh, this is indeed what we see uh, in this graph as we increase the temperature, the, uh, the quality of the reconstruction uh, drops. Um, so let me now describe you uh, several extensions of this of this uh, idea. Uh, one extension that we can do is do that we is that we can take the the very same idea and extend it to open system. Instead of talking about Hamiltonians, we can now talk about, for example, Lindbladians. And Lindbladians are just um, uh, are models for system that uh, for open quantum system, and they involve evolve in, in some with some interaction with the environment and Assuming this interaction is is Markovian and and and, um, and short range, range etc., one can uh, derive uh, these operators LS that describe uh, the Limbladian and um, the evolution of the density matrix is now governed by this uh, Limbladian equation uh, Limblad equation. So there, in addition to the Commutator with H that we saw before, we now have all these this, uh, these extra terms of uh, which is uh, a dissipation. But because because of the commutators here, then the entire math entire mathematical structure that we had before comes right through, and we can do everything like we did before. We can do it on on this uh, underlying equation, and therefore we can also derive uh, this um, this generalized Enfest. Uh, equation for the uh, for the expectation value of any observable a, um, and uh, so we get something like that. And um, from this from this equation, we can we can write up uh, we can what we can do is we can uh, expand the the, the different uh, um, uh, ls operators in, in in a basis and uh, and and and. And write down their coefficient as, as, as CSR, and um, essentially everything just follows through. All we have to do is now use the larger vector to describe the system. One part will describe the Hamiltonian, the other part will describe uh, these uh, LS operators, and uh, we will have a K matrix, and everything will be uh, just the same. Um, this method can be very useful in, in learning noise in quantum computers, I think. Um, a good model to the noise in quantum computers is some sort of a Lindbladian. So maybe this method can be used to, to learn this, uh, the different uh, generator of the, of the Lindbladian. Um, and um, <clears throat> this is an example of, uh, of, of using this method numerically on a Lindbladian of, uh, of, uh, of six, uh, with, the, with the six particles. Again, we use some sort of uh, um, a random Hamiltonian with a random uh, Lindbladian, and um, as you and uh, as you can see, the when we add more and more uh, constraint to the system, the quality of the reconstruction uh, improves. Um, there is another interesting thing about this open system. Uh, Itai, business. there is a question. Give me a second. Okay. Um, yeah, so 
Philip, you can you can talk. Ah, okay, thanks. Uh, yeah, it was only about the uh, actually about the previous slides, uh, but maybe uh, I just didn't notice. But uh, I wanted to ask what epsilon exactly meant in those like. Okay, so epsilon. Study. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So epsilon was the uncertainty in the K matrix that we got due to the finite number of measurements. Uh, right. Okay. Okay. Like the uh, but uncertainty in uh, like on the level of the uh, expectation value of the whole matrix or like uh, the, oh, of a single entry on the single entry. Okay. Right. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. And the second, maybe I didn't notice also, like what are the di dimensions on those plots, on the, also on the previous plots? Which uh, plots? Uh, like here, uh, yeah, here, uh -huh. yeah. Uh, yeah, because, uh, yeah, uh, there is uh, just how many particles are here and... <laughs> okay, so um, in this numerical result, um, um, these were usually very small models of like, 12 particles mm -hmm. or 10 particles, something like that. We did the exact diagonalization in some sense. There we also did uh, some MPS uh, simulations. I, I don't have the graphs here, in which we simulated something like 100 particles, for example, in Vladian, for example. And then we, ah. we, mm -hmm. we, looked, we looked at a, a small region of the system and we managed to reconstruct the Vladian of that small region. OK, nice. Uh, thank you. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, just a quick follow-up, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Itai. So, so um, I was I was expecting epsilon to relate to the to the actual Hamiltonian you were learning and how accurately you learned it, but you, you said it was related to the K matrix. So, can you clarify? Yes. So epsilon. So epsilon is is um, because we did everything numerically. Um, uh, so so epsilon is actually the the error that you get from having perfect measurement with finite statistics. So we added, we added this, this noise that behaves as if you were, uh, as if you were, you were, you know, you were measuring only with a finite number of, of measurements. And so uh, every, your empirical averages will be, will be different from the exact one and, and by, by this order, by this S. Okay, okay. Um, okay, so um, another, what I was saying is that another thing that is interesting about this um, um, open system is that it can, it can enable us to use this method to learn a classical Hamiltonian actually. So the idea is that, you know, you take a classical Hamiltonian and you add to it these dissipators. Okay, these quantum guys that might not commute with it, but you know, might, for example, dissipate you toward a certain, certain, uh, certain states. Um, but the, the, the steady state will be also affected by the Hamiltonian. So the steady state will, ha will have, the steady state of the global system will have some information about this Hamiltonian. So even though the Hamiltonian is completely classical and you, and you will be unable to learn it using our method if you only, looked at a closed system of this Hamiltonian, if you look at the combination of this Hamiltonian plus some dissipators, some of this, of this open system, then you will be able to, then you will be able to learn it. Then you will, you will because the, uh, the, the entire dynamics is, is, uh, is not commuting now, um, you will be uh, able to also now recover the classical Hamiltonian. So this is an example where we, um, we are learning, uh, there is a, a, a classical random Ising model to local, for example, nearest neighbors of, of six spins. Uh, and we are adding some known dissipation to it. These, these guys will be the L, LS operators. And uh, together, uh, the system goes to a non-trivial steady state. And by uh, using our method on that steady state, we are able to recover the, uh, the classical uh, the classical random uh, Hamiltonian uh, with very good, uh, with very good uh, accuracy. So, you know, even with, uh, sorry. So how does this compare to other methods for learning classical Hamiltonians? Are you going to talk about it later or? Um, I, I don't have a, I don't have a good answer because I don't, 
the setup is not really classical in that sense, right? I mean, right. But if you are trying to learn classical Hamiltonians using, I assume there are other ways. Um, right. Um, well, the, as I, I, I will mention it, there is there is a way. I mean, there is a, a famous problem is is to learn the Gibbs state of a classical Hamiltonian. This is known as, for example, as a Boltzmann machine of, or a Markov random field. Um, so so these. In this system, sometimes you, you have lower bound. You have lower bound, and these these problems might sometimes be exponential. Whereas here, everything depends on the gap. So, you know, it could be that you might be able to learn these uh, local Hamiltonian more efficiently using using these methods. I, I, I don't know. I don't have a, a good answer. I mean, it all depends on the gap in, in the end. Um, okay. Um, so the and the final extension that I want to uh, to propose is is to extend this method to dynamics. If we now return to the Enfest uh, equation here, then we might not consider only steady state, but actually states that evolve in time. And so we will not uh, disregard the left hand side of this equation. And um, what we can do now, if we have a system that actually evolve, evolves evolves in time, is is that it evolved for some capital time t? We will get this equation dividing it by t. We will we will get now this equation, and what you can see is that actually uh, this integral can now be written as some sort of an effective density matrix row uh, average that I've written here, which is given as the average of all the of all the densities matrices along the time evolution, and. Um, we will get, as a result of this uh, uh, equation, we will now, if we do the same math mathematics that we did before, we will now get a non-homogeneous equation. Uh, we will get the same k, but it will, this time it will be equal to some, to some uh, non-homogeneous term, which will come from this side of the equation. And uh, well, we can just, as we did before, we can just measure these, uh, this k empirically and, and use it in order to recover uh, to recover C. Um, so this is the this is the equation that we are using. For for T goes to infinity, um, this this state here that we have, this this average row will actually go into a convex combination of of all the um, of all the eigenstate that participate in the initial state with with, with positive weights. So it will be it will it, it will be a steady state of h, of course, and it will commute with h. So for t goes to into infinity, if we if we evolve the system for a long time, then then we can actually use uh, the previous method. Um, and um, here, all the information about the Hamiltonian will only be stored in k, not in this b, because now the b will disappear because we are taking t to infinity. Um, so everything will be in k. Um, and which can be a, pro a problem, for example, because it can have a, a small gap. And um, what we will need, we will need uh, many measurements probably um, in order to, to sample these this expectation values uh, along the, the time evolution. But the good thing about this method is, is that now it will be uh, much less uh, sensitive to preparation errors, okay? Because we are looking at steady states in some sense, effective steady states. So it will be, uh, it will save us uh, from all sorts of uh, systematical errors that can occur in, in, in the preparation of the system. On the other hand, uh, if we take t to, uh, to zero, we actually get the NFS equation, and, and, and then we can also use it in order to, uh, to, to study the Hamilton. And this was actually the method of um, Marcos da Silvia et al. from 2011, and, and they used it in order to, um, to recover H. It should be noticed that here, if we now expand H in, um, in some basis, then actually the right-hand side here in this equation will have no information about, about H. Um, uh, everything in, in some, every, because the state, the state of the system will be only the initial state which can be arbitrary. So there is the, the entire information of the of the system will uh, will be of h actually will be given on the on the time derivative which is on the left side, and this also implies that this system might not suffer from the problem of having a, a gap. We can always pick up 
an initial state for which this k, which will be, as I said, independent of h, uh, will, will have a gap. On the other hand, if we are trying to uh, estimate empirically this uh, time derivative, that be, might be a bit tricky. We will need to take very short time measurements. And um, in, in, in addition, uh, this, uh, this setup is very sensitive, of course, to preparation error because we're just preparing a state and immediately we're trying to measure it. Um, so, uh, but as nevertheless, our method is, 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 is possible at all, at all ranges of, 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 of T. So um, it would be interesting to, to see exactly in, if there are some ranges in which you can, you know, you can benefit from, uh, from, both, uh, from both ends. Uh, this is uh, this is an example of um, of a time reconstruction, and this is a very uh, it, it's a very early numeric. So, what we actually sorry what we actually did in this example is ignore the left hand side. We just try to uh, just try to use this method, uh, of just try to use our method on the homogeneous uh, equation uh, for finite time. And as as you can see, as time um, as time proceeds. Uh, the uh, the effective row of the system becomes more and more uh, uh, close to a steady state of the system, and so the reconstruction error uh, uh, drops. This is uh, the, the system was here, I think, uh, 12 spins with random 12 spin with two body nearest neighbors, and we were trying to reconstruct the middle eight, eight uh, chunk of the eight spins there. Um, okay, so let me... Um, let me end in here. I will just put some future, some questions and some future directions we would like to go in. Uh, so, so far, uh, as I was saying, all this method has been uh, either on paper or on the computer, but it was not tested uh, on real physical hardware. So I think it will be extremely interesting to see how, how well it performs in, in, actual, in actual life. Um, in particular, uh, you know, in order to do that and, and in order for it to be successful, it must be able to somehow handle uh, spam errors, which is state errors that are due to systematic uh, errors in, in state preparation and in measurement. So as I was saying, uh, when we only look at steady states, for example, in a, in a open system with dissipation, then we might not be very sensitive to preparation error. So this is good, but uh, what about measurements? We, we assume perfect measurement here. So for example, I think an interesting direction would be whether we can take this method and somehow combine it with uh, gate state tomography and, 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 and using this combination somehow mitigate the measurement error and take them into account when we are measuring our K matrix. So I think that's, that's an interesting direction to, to pursue. Um, what about the gaps? Um, what can we do, at least theoretically, uh, maybe when the gap closes down? Um, so essentially, when the gap closes down, that means that we are approaching a situation in which the homogeneous equation is degenerate. Um, the extreme case of this is, of course, the classical case. And as I was, uh, I was telling Dorit, uh, in the classical case, a very um, uh, an equivalent problem in some sense is, is, is the problem of, of, of learning a Boltzmann machine. So a Boltzmann machine can be thought of like the Gibbs state of a classical Hamiltonian, for example, an Ising model. And, and, and so in the classical setup, this is just uh, many particle multivariate probability distribution. And, and we are allowed to, to sample from it. And uh, the question is, OK, given Given the abilities to sample from it, can we can we learn the underlying uh, interaction graph and these W and theta weights? And um, there are many um, results in this area. There are some uh, tight algorithms uh, which are we know are, are optimal in the sense that they match the information theoretic bounds. Um, and, and an important ingredient in all these algorithms is, is the Markovianity of, 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 this, of this probability distribution. It is, uh, it is also called a, a random uh, Markov, uh, Markov random field. And um, uh, it, 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 it comes from the fact that 
this, if I write down this Hamiltonian here, this, uh, sorry, the exponent of this Hamiltonian, then it will factor to a product of, of uh, uh, to a product of, uh, of different terms. Um, and this product it, it leads to this Markovianity uh, property so that, you know, if, if this guy is in some sense shielded away from the blue guys, then if I uh, condition, uh, if I look at the conditional probability of A on, on, on the green guy and the blue guys, it will be actually independent of the blue guys. So this is Markovianity and it is, it is used in the, in the classical learning uh, algorithm. But, but strangely, I mean, not strange, but when we go to the quantum setup, we completely lose Markovianity. And this is because now the terms don't commute. But if they don't commute, then we can use our method. So, so the question that I'm, I'm trying to, to ask here is whether we can somehow maybe use some sort of classical approach or classical algorithm uh, to handle the situation when the gap closed down, because maybe then we are in some sense approaching uh, a system which is in close to being Markovian. Um, so uh, like a toy model, uh, to maybe a, a good point, a good point to start with this uh, question is to try to understand whether we can learn commuting Hamiltonians. And commuting Hamiltonians against our method will completely fail. And um, can we learn their their Gibbs state? And uh, we already have some pre preliminary results. For example, we know how we can use um, how we can learn the Gibbs state of uh, uh, two local commuting Hamiltonians using the uh, mechanism of Bravi and Vialli. The idea is to use first our quantum method just to recognize the, uh, uh, the different projectors in the decomposition of Bravi and Vialli and then fit it to the classical algorithm. Um, a different type, very different, a different type of commuting Hamiltonian that we also can learn is, all, is, is, uh, is, is a commuting Hamiltonian that comes from the surface code of, of, of Kitaev. So there is also some interesting um, structures there. Um, okay, so uh, this is it. Uh, thank you. How, who's clapping hands? Just me? <laughs> <laughs> no, more than me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> thank you, Itai. Thank um, you. So whoever has questions is uh, now is the time. Um, if you can write your questions and answers uh, in the box. We have a few more seconds to do that. Um, and otherwise, um, we'll just say thank you, Itai, and we'll reconvene you. in uh, 15 minutes for David's talk. Thank you. Okay. okay, thank you. See you later. See you.